My name is Taryn Hart, and I am with Occupied Media, and I blog at plutocracyfiles.com. Hi, I'm Alexa D. O'Brien. I am a American citizen who founded US Day of Rage, um, which is basically the idea that uh, one citizen, one dollar, one vote. Uh, essentially, uh, it, it's uh, calling for an Article 5 constitutional convention. We were one of the original endorsers and organizers of September 17th action for Occupy Wall Street. Great. And, and Great. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, really start with, you know, you get the impression people will say, you know, there's this ad busters ad calling for the occupation and then it happened and that was, you know, the end of it. And really there are several groups, including U.S. Day of Rage, who were doing a lot of organizing before that. And really your group goes back considerably before the ad busters ad. Um, and my understanding is that you started U.S. Well, I've talked to several people now about kind of history and these types of things. And one thing that gets mentioned a lot is Wisconsin. And then, of course, also the Arab Spring. And you were involved with both of those. Well, I mean, not, not directly Wisconsin involved, but they maybe <clears throat> spurred starting U.S. Day of Rage. Would that be correct? Yeah. Uh, it started the I – mean, we, were, we were thinking about it before in February. Um, you know, there was discussion. I mean, because we had obviously uh, – even in casual conversations, um, understood that American civic space and, di and discourse was sort of locked into these uh, talking points. And, uh, you know, we were demoralized by that prospect, right? And so it, the night of March 10th, I mean, is really when, um, you know, the, the gun got fired because I was watching what was happening in Wisconsin and, you know, whether or not you are in a union or not in a union, the complete blockade of the assembly of people, uh, to me, signaled a very, very dangerous precedent. And uh, really the uh, catalyst for a kind of dangerous level of cynicism towards government. <clears throat> and then it sort of, you know, it took off uh, in a way that, you know, even I wasn't expecting, which is kind of how this whole year has been for lots of us. It's just been a crazy year. Right. I really get but anyway, so then it became a responsibility. Right. And so you started U.S. Day of Rage in response to March 10th? It was in response to a lot of things. I mean, <clears throat> um, the, certainly the, the impetus that night was just simply, it was an act, uh, you know, perhaps it was, it, whether it was rational or irrational, it was an impulse that, you know, sort of just welled up from within, with, within me, right? Um, but of course, you know, a, a parking a Twitter profile does not a, you know, movement make or even an organization make. So there's so many other things. I mean, I had covered Bahrain very intimately. I had also covered uh, Guantanamo uh, and had been in the process of, you know, discovering a lot of things about Guantanamo Bay. Um, and so um, I think, you know, I just, I'm fairly observant individual, especially around groups. And, and when I talked to my friends or colleagues or associates, there was this sort of underlying shame that a lot of Americans felt and, and a sense of demoralization. And, you know, I really reject the idea that Americans are apathetic. It's not to say that there aren't apathetic people, uh, but Americans are demoralized because the system's broken. Right. So, you know, being who I am, I just, uh, you know, I, I have a solution for that. I'm just joking. That's, <laughs> a, that's a joke. Um, <laughs> so it was just a sort of a process and it, it unfolded very naturally. Right. And so, okay. So you started around March, you start a Twitter, you start a web page. Um, and then what are kind of the big events between then and September 17th? Well, firstly, we were going to design a platform around discourse. I mean, a lot of us, uh, you know, who we were in discussions with, you know, had been covering or were aware of the so sort of how social media was changing um, the way in which people were gathering information, especially around, you know, from Tunisia onward. Um, and, you know, we, we started a hashtag. And, of course, you know, it, it very much in line with sort of the Declaration of Independence, it, it was a place to offer Americans a, 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 a sort of a, a neutral place where they could just list grievances. And 
we wanted to use that to sort of figure out what are the major issues that Americans are really thinking about in a casual way in the conversations, uh, you know, on Twitter. And, you know, originally we were going to, we were just sort of designing, you know, a platform that we would host sort of hashtag debates, much like Bahrain did around the Constitution or in Egypt. Um, you know, we were sort of in conversation with each other about, well, we'll, we'll do formal debates like Lincoln-Douglas debates. We'll, we'll create a space where people can have intelligent discourse again, as well as these hashtag debates. Um, and then it just sort of dawned on us one night that most of these grievances sourced to corrupt elections, that if you got the money out of, it's not just simply the money, if you dismantled the system of influence, the patronage network of the factions that control our government, you essentially would remedy a myriad abuses, myriad abuses and ills of a government. And it was the kind of thing that, you know, both left and right could buy. I mean, obviously with some compromise as to what those special interests are, you know, right. So that's where we got that one citizen, one dollar, one vote. And, and from that point forward, you know, we, that was our one demand. So flash forward, you know, of course, there was the process of covering, uh, w, you know, covering for WL Central, working a full-time job and, uh, you know, doing this and building the site. And, you know, uh, we, we held off on calling a date because we really wanted to stick rudder in and really just steady as she goes. We knew that we had to listen to the groundswell, like the moment would come. And so the, the site was up and, you know, we started to get organizers. We started organizing originally. And by organizing, I mean people from states would say, hey, I want to manage the Twitter profile. Hey, I'd like to start an organization in, you know, uh, Indiana was the first state to organize. Um, uh, so, you know, like, it, it, there's an educational process because these aren't activists. These are actually mostly mainly citizens who are doing right. it. So I certainly I, am. Yeah, so it was like, you know, I need to really learn about how, you know, this affects policy in my state. And we were talking about building a content management system. All, you know, of course, then we put that on the back burner. And in July, when I saw the call to occupy Wall Street, it was just an instinct. Like, I knew okay, this is the first one. Because we were actually going to do rolling uh, protests. It's not like we were going to have one big protest. Right. It was really the idea that we would roll them. They would just keep rolling. So if, as one state sort of died out, another state would come up. And really it was to, to, to draw attention to this issue of, of, of our corrupt government. And so flash forward, like, you know, we just started organizing. And when we, we endorsed the call for September 17th with, you know, Publius you know, is very, very unhappy. <laughs> and I get teased a lot because I love Publius. <laughs> but it's like there's this, this video I once made of, like, uh, lol cats and, like, you know, the revolution. And it's like, I love this video. <laughs> and nobody loves this video. So I'm like, Publius is very, very unhappy. And, it, and some people are like, who's Publius? <laughs> so anyway, we, that poster, you know, we suddenly got one after another, people wanted to organize California. They wanted to organize Texas. They wanted to organize lots of Southern states, lots of middle American states. So we had organizers and we still have them. I mean, they're the main kind of contact point people for the main uh, um, Twitter profile and website. Fiance in Iraq during the budget crisis doesn't know if he's going to get paid. Two former military people have a child on Medicaid. Don't know if he's going to, the child's going to, uh, get their medication. Um, people who've lost their homes to Citibank. I mean, these were the people who were organizing. And, and then from there, it was just really hard work. I mean, everybody in California, Oregon, Washington, Texas, and, and New York, you know, we organized our own protests, um, you know, our, our, our part in that protest. And on September 17th, in conjunction with anti-banks, you know, there were 19 protests globally. So, yeah. So, okay, and, and were there, were you, you know, I know from the time the Adbusters call went out to September 17th, there were maybe, there were several groups that were maybe starting to work together a little bit. I don't know if you were part of that, but like the New York General Assembly and apparently some, I know David DeGraw and some, AMP, the people from AMP status were, had been involved for some time. Were you guys starting to come together at all? Did you go to the well, Adbusters meetings? 
Um, you know, I, I was at the General Assembly. Um, the Adbusters meetings, you know, to be quite honest with you, I had email conversations with Adbusters, but, you know, it, for me, it was kind of like going in and just doing the effective action that needed to be done. Do you know what I mean? So um, I was at pretty much every General Assembly meeting, um, and, uh, you know, we endorsed the call to uh, a public assembly, an independent and public assembly on Wall Street. So yes, we were very much working in concert. What I mean to say in concert, I mean the General Assembly doesn't, at the time, didn't recognize groups, only right. individuals. So uh, it, it's, there was no endorsement uh, backwards, right. you know, officially, but, you know, certainly we were supporting the call. Right. I really, I really do like that focus um, that your group has had. I have felt like it is the focus. Um, the same thing that you just said, which is that, you know, there's all of these myriad of issues, almost seemingly insurmountable number of issues, but that really come back to the fact that our political system's been hijacked. And I think when people talk about um, the 99%, even that slogan, some people will tend to think of it in strictly economic terms, but I think, it, I think it's better to think of it in political terms in the sense that the 1% has hijacked the government. We no longer feel that we have a democracy that is in any meaningful sense responsive to the people. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think that all of the, you know, your movement was a natural fit for the 99% movement, if I look at like the statements David DeGraw was making well before the Adbusters call, they seem to me very similar to what your organization was saying. And also very similar, I think, to the sentiment that was happening in Wisconsin, despite, you know, how Wisconsin was kind of channeled. Um, the way I look at it is that, you know, you can have, personally as an individual, I don't take offense if somebody is right wing or left wing. You know, I can handle it. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, uh, I can handle the fact that people are naturally self-interested, although we also, ideally, in a healthy democracy, and this is a very, you know, ancient idea, you know, that a healthy democracy, you know, Tocqueville talks about self-interest rightly understood. So there is some sense of, like, self-interest says, let me build my wall up, but what's going to actually create affinity? Um, you know, uh, there are people who argue conservatives might even agree with this, that religion plays an important role in democracies in the sense of other-centeredness. You know, and th these are, you know, people can think of those as provocative ideas, but, you know, there is some wisdom in that, in the, not, maybe not religion, but the idea of other-centeredness as being a balance to self-interest. So, of course, the difference between the left and the right is like, who is to, is, is that government's responsibility or is that the responsibility of the individual? But regardless of that particular, disc, you know, uh, intellectual, uh, you know, conversation uh, or battle, fundamentally, our government, its checks and balances are broken. So we can wax poetic about the fact that we need a strong executive or that the executive has the power that, you know, has been eroded over time because of television and other things and blah, 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 or, you know, legislative power. But when both are owned by a few factions, there is no check. But when that corruptive force corrupts the judicial branch, you know, there is no checks and balances. And what we essentially have is a government captured by factions, which this is not, you know, a big shock. You know, our, our founders warned of this. Eisenhower warned of this. Um, and, you know, it's not a battle. It's not to say that there aren't other important issues or corollary issues, but, you know, that's, that's our focus. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, so, and so you guys are put, moving, would like to move for a constitutional convention. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure, yeah. So we're, we want to call for an Article 5. You know, they're non-binding. Constitutional conventions are non-binding. I mean, it's not to say that it's easy peasy, you know, because our state legislators are also, legislative branches in many cases, depends on the state, are also corrupted um, by the same influence that our federal representatives and legislatures are corrupted. Um, but essentially it is, what, it is essentially what the founders gave us in the case of captured government, is that states can petition the federal government 
for a constitutional convention in order for all sides to discuss how they can restore democracy. And certainly we want to look to electoral reform. You know, in many cases, the left and right can certainly agree that one citizen, one dollar, one vote. We could, we could agree, hypothetically, okay, all special interests out, right? Or all special interests are capped at the same level as human beings. The issue where it becomes a little bit more complicated, uh, perhaps, but it certainly is doable, is the capping. I mean, some people might regard that as a violation of First Amendment rights. And other people say, well, that allows the wealthy to basically, you know, run government. So these are the kinds of things we need to discuss. I think it would be great for America. To, it, it would be essentially a, 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 you know, a deep tuning fork, you know, I'm not. I'm sure that many Americans want this. The question is: Is how do we do it in a way where powerful special interests do not want Americans to have this debate? And that's the problem. And that's the that's really the fulcrum of the issue. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, how how are you proposing? What can people do? to get on board with if they're interested or want to participate or want to help? How can they get on board? Well, they can contact us. And we also have a mashup, you know, uh, mashup page. They can meet in each state, form groups. Firstly, there's a couple things. There's a learning curve involved around Article 5. Um, the next action that U.S. Day of Rage will do is a coordinated national action that if our federal representatives do not hear us, because there actually have already been 400 plus applications for this process from, you know, from 49 states. So one gentleman, um, Bill Warner, he's even sued the federal government over this issue. So um, it's certainly using the leverage that we have with social media and with swarms to basically corner our reps um, this is sort of a new phenomenon and we can do it the same with our state legislators. Um, and then of course, if the, these tactics don't work, I mean, we have nonviolent civil disobedience and, you know, um, and, and so the next occupation, uh, we are planning, uh, as a contingency is the occupation of every capital in the United States, state capital. Okay. This is going to uh, happen. <clears throat> You know, the alternative is a, a nightmarish scenario. This has to happen. <clears throat> um, let's talk a little bit about social media and the impact of social media. I mean, I remember, you know, hearing about it with the Arab Spring, and I, I kind of discarded it. But then, you know, as this has unfolded, I remember, you know, I had a moment where I was watching the 700 arrests on the Brooklyn Bridge on live feed and following it on Twitter. And, you know, it was so weird to hear it reported by the media so much later <laughs> and realize, and then, and then, and then at some point I realized that I no longer check the traditional media. I no longer look to them at all. I wasn't interested in what they had to say. They seemed really behind things with Occupy Wall Street in particular. You know, because you have the live feeds, because the Twitter is happening, because there's um, blogs that are covering it, um, you know, including, you know, your blog, but, you know, various blogs that are covering it, sure. uh, you know, at best, I'll get to alternative media. I will actually, I don't to, we're on. the only blog covering it. I'm just oh, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm covering it. Um, so, um yeah, but I mean, I I really didn't realize it sounded it sounds to me like you understood that this was happening before the um, before this happened. I I really didn't. When people talked about it with the Arab Spring, I kind of yeah okay. I but I didn't understand the impact, and it really I think is um, transformative. I mean, I think people in the General Assembly didn't get it either. I mean, the Internet group couldn't get a website up until three days before. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, the General Assembly, individuals within the General Assembly, I mean, did other things that were, you know, important as well. I mean, like, uh, you know, the Arts and Culture Committee and the Outreach Committee, I want to squeeze all their cheeks every time I see them because they were just phenomenal. Um, so, 
uh, yeah, I mean, you certainly saw it because, you know, when you cover something intimately, I mean, why five protests? I mean, that's classic. You know, you have the big protest and then you have smaller ones in different villages or different locations and you're not going to have the same amount of people, but there's an impact that makes it national. And that's like, that's classic right out of, from Tunisia. I mean, you could just see that model. Also, right. um, you know, people were talking about traditional press coverage. It's not that it's not important to close the deal, right, eventually, or some kind of mainstream, uh, you know, populist sort of sentiment to, to, to motivate our legislature, so to speak, for, for our right. interests. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, we didn't really care whether they covered it or not. Because, you know, I mean... It, it, we look at the problem structurally. So, like, there are institutions that prop up democratic republics and democratic societies. The press, right? Informed citizenry, the civic space. So that's where you have discourse or the marketplace of ideas. Um, you know, and you also have political coalition building, uh, all that kind of stuff. And then you have, you know, our elections. And when you have those three things operational, you have an engaged populace. And it, what you've seen is, of course, the press, our elections, and the civic space have all been fiscalized. Uh, they're all controlled by these powerful factions. <clears throat> so it's no wonder Americans don't engage in politics because on some level they know it's a farce. You, you know what I mean? Or, or they, if they engage, it's like the loudest, most extreme voices win the, you know, win the because that's, you know, the, it, it brings ratings up. It's dramatic and blah, blah. So <clears throat> in order to get to elections, you know, for us at least, the motivation was we had to crack the uh, casket on the civic space. And, uh, you know, young people, they don't trust organ uh, traditional forms of organized politics. Right. Right. Blah, yeah, blah, blah. I, um, <clears throat> you know, in terms of the traditional media, I mean, it is important that they cover us eventually. But I feel like watching it, that we're driving them at this point, that they're, that, that they have to cover us because our media is dominating the conversation at a level that they, you know, they have to engage whether they want to or not. So, you know, I just don't feel like they're leading it. I feel like they're behind they We're, we're driving them. And so whether that, you know, I, I heard, I heard you interviewed, I, I watched some interviews of yours, um, before speaking with you today, and you're recently discussing with RT, um, and she and I think the reporter asked you, uh, you know, what if the media loses interest? And and uh, you know, you just you, you know, I think your question back was the traditional media. I mean, who are you talking about? Um, and and that's definitely how I felt about it. That they're you know, the traditional media will have to respond to it as long as it maintain. as, as I feel. I mean, I feel they're responding to us at this point. Do you agree with that? They're starting to. It's the same thing. I mean, we've, we've tweeted this before. It's like people didn't think that silent films would go away, but they did. So, <clears throat> you know, it's a question of market power. Um, I'm, I'm not living in some, like, you know, la-la land where I think that, you know, these interests are not very powerful and they could crush us. They could, <clears throat> but um, uh, the bottom line is, is people are getting their information more and more from trusted networks. They visit Facebook and they see news items there. And, you know, I have, I think my actually personal Facebook page has probably been, um, you know, underestimated in terms of the influence it's had because I have friends from all sectors of society. I actually, uh, you know, uh, left, right, 1%, 99%. And because I, you know, am a, you know, responsible, normal, ordinary person, I mean, you know, and, and I'm really not even, prior to January, <clears throat> because I sort of was disengaged from the partisanship, like I, I look at it more structurally generally, uh, I wasn't really somebody who, who was crazy during the last election. You know, I, I really actually I didn't really like Obama, to tell you the truth. I didn't think of him as a reformer. It's same thing with the Republicans. So when this sort of thing with Occupy Wall Street came out, people, I think they listened. <clears throat> and that, that's, that's that personal trust thing that's going on. You know, I, 
I want my country to, um, I want Americans to feel like you left and right. I mean, like on some level, we have to find some common ground. I mean, we are countrymen and women and our nation is not being governed and we're not able to talk about these things. And so many people are disenfranchised from that conversation because it's so ridiculous. <clears throat> and yeah, um, I mean, the, con the conversation that was happening in the traditional media was insane. It just, it was insane. It completely was oblivious to the problems that everybody knew. I felt like, I felt like these ideas were completely mainstream. I mean, you know, I remember seeing Jared Bernstein, who was, you know, Joe Biden's vice, you know, Joe Biden's economist, chief economist, as mainstream as they come, writing on his blog that money at this point bought ideas, that the ideas that were presented as that the agenda that was being set, that the range of ideas was being bought in Washington. That's coming from just a completely mainstream source. So, I mean, I've, and I felt like, I felt like you could say that to almost anybody and they would agree with you that, oh, well, everything is bought, that that's something you could say just to a stranger on the street, not knowing what their political persuasion is, nothing. That was just something that was common, that is common knowledge in our country. And so when this happened, I think, you know, finally, everybody felt like finally somebody was saying what everybody knew and it really you know, struck that chord. And it was bizarre to me to see, you know, people from like the Democratic Party say things like, oh, they're not messaging correctly or these types of traditional things when, you know, what they were doing was telling a fundamental truth. And that is what resonated. The kind of slick messaging at people or trying to manipulate people into getting their votes is exactly what was making people disengage but as soon as somebody finally finally said what was actually happening you know it just there was just a groundswell I mean it must have it must be amazing to have watched it from kind of the ground zero level you guys couldn't have known that it would have this much impact I have to say I, I disagree I mean I'm not a, listen I'm just a very ordinary person so I'm not going to say like oh I knew like I, I'm you know I have you know, omniscient vision and I can see the future. I can't. Sometimes in the middle of the night, four o'clock in the morning when I was, uh, you know, hadn't slept in two days and uh, I had to get up for work and I was working on organizing it. I mean, there's a, sometimes I would, I would say, you know, to myself, like, um, you know, I hope I'm doing this because I believe this is the right thing to do and I'm going to just trust that. But I, I have to say on some level I knew that it would blow like this like you know that's why you look at, look at all the you know behind the scenes the digital outreach which wasn't happening on the ground was take the square anti-banks you know European Revolution US Day of Rage I mean we were pushing it out there and we were all uh, those people are all from WL Central you know, those are all contributors who've been covering on the ground or either on social media covering the revolutions. I mean, the, uh, the two gentlemen that are behind Take the Square have been with WS Central for a very long time. And, you know, they were, they have stories. I mean, they tried to get into Syria and uh, at the border, one of the, uh, the, the guard asked, asked him if he was a terrorist or a tourista. It was really funny. And luckily he didn't get in because it's been really bloody there. But, um, well, I mean, I, I mean that in a balanced way. I mean, obviously, we need more coverage in Syria um, for his own safety. Um, so we were very aware of what was going on and what we kind of needed to do. Um, yeah. I mean, we're grateful. Right. You know? But, well, yeah. And actually, you know, when you say that, it made me think that I was looking back at some of the things that David DeGraw had written into some of them in 2010 and he seemed pretty confident too that something would happen but of course they had an initial action in june that only 16 people showed up for and only four people were willing to occupy so it's hard to know i guess what that exact moment will be even michael moore who's been doing this for decades said i always knew this would happen <laughs> i always knew the people would rise up Here's the question. Americans look and Super Bowl everything. I mean, people were like, well, how many people will show up for September 17th? You know, it's relevant to us because 
what we're talking about here is not simply a strategy to manipulate, right? Which is what you're talking about. Right. What we're talking about here is, it, you can look at this in the former Eastern Bloc countries, is that acts of conscience, getting back down to something bedrock, you know, why is democratic society considered to be the best form of government by many people? I mean, the Marxists will kill me, you know, that's fine. But, you know, many people across the world would hope to have and live in some kind of democracy, whether it's a republic or a parliamentary or whatever, it doesn't matter. There's something fundamentally sound about the idea of basic human rights, basic, you know, our Bill of Rights. And, and underneath all the, you know, spectacle and the, the Super Bowl and the, you know, crap that we see, you know, put out there that commercializes it and turns it into some kind of fiscal product, there's something very deeply profound about that. And that's what people need to focus on. It, you know, let go of all the other stuff because it doesn't work. It's, it's got us into this. We need to look at core problems, look at core issues, core values, um, you know, within ourselves and act on our conscience. And, you know, when we do that, you know, the ship straightens out. When we live in the world of uh, just simply managed political coalitions and talking points, we essentially lose what's the most important indicator. What is in our self-interest? Who are we? And, and me as a citizen, in my class, in my place in society, what is in my self-interest? And am I being represented by government? So where do you see it going? You obviously are hoping for, like you said earlier, um, you feel that it has to work. It, something has to fundamentally change. Well, I'm not a master of the universe, so you know, we'll see what happens. More will be revealed. I think with things like this, you know, you need a lot of flexibility as an organization because you need to call things as they are developing on the ground. You, you know, strategies are good because it, it gets everybody's mind in sync with what are like, you know, what are our goals, what are our values. Um, and, you know, we have a group of people that are fleshing out all the varied prongs of a strategy. But, uh, you know, our next, um, uh, there's two things. There's the education curve for the Article 5 that we're ramping up. And another other thing is um, we are essentially going to call out every single federal representative on the Article 5 is issue around um, either, uh, you know, Walker's uh, suit or just simply corporate personhood. We're deciding on that right now. And um, we did this, you know, with the whistle. I did it with the Whistleblower Act. You know, <clears throat> you can do a lot with social media. So, um, and other, and, and traditional citizen lobbying. So that will be basically the call out. Um, and that will build basically awareness. And you know, it's like we're one, of, one amongst many. One of the great things about this age is you can do anything as long as you don't care who takes credit. You know, that's really fundamental. You can do anything as long as you don't care who takes credit. So it's really, you know, we also are syncing up with other grassroots organizations. Um, you know, somebody just drafted and sent me um, a list of all the Article 5 grassroots, and we want to go grassroots. We don't want any entrenched, managed po politicians. You know, they are going to come in down the pike, like we know that. That's what happens. But, but for now, we want to focus on people, just, you know, ordinary citizens or activists who haven't had a chance to actually have a space or voice. And we'll, you know, form partnerships with them or affinity and uh, get this done. Great. So, all right, what is, I heard you talk a little bit on RT about the demands issue. I thought you had a great response to it, which was that the question itself assumes that, you know, we're something, you know, we're masters of the universe, we're something other than ordinary citizens who are trying to solve and that are trying to come together and talk about how to solve an incredibly difficult problem. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, if you had anything additional. Well, that's the Super Bowl lack of creativity way to look at it. I mean, fundamentally to me, and this is my opinion, I'm one voice amongst many, OWS is the civic square. Who owns the civic square? Well, in reality, you know, Goldman Sachs and, uh, you know, Citigroup and, uh, you know, a bunch of other people or factions own the civic square because the NYPD and the... Oakland PD there, they work for them and the defense contractors that give them their weapons. So it's really actually, it's a civic square. I guarantee you that in 10 or 15 years, this is my opinion, 
what you're going to see is a billion movements came out of Occupy Wall Street, for one thing. And those movements spawned a ton of reform across different areas of society, other kinds of political organizations, uh, lots of ideas and creativity. Because that's what's really actually happening in those working groups. It's not just lists of grievances. It's actually solutions are being drawn up with technology and electoral reform. There's political scientists down there doing like voting experiments. There's all sorts of creativity happening and unleashed because the space has been made for it, right? So that's happening. I think whether or not they come up with a demand or not is not my concern because uh, I'm not trying to look at it through the lens of, of, of real, you know, real political execution of power. You know, there's the... I, I, it's not that I don't live with the realization that these things can be crushed, but I'm more concerned about people acting from their honest, authentic selves because I feel like that is actually what engages the populace. Do you know what I mean? Like if they are engaged in the conversation, they're there and they're participating, and they're invested, and that's what you need in a democracy. Yeah, I mean, it's really amazing if you go watch a General Assembly to watch people feel engaged and empowered maybe for the first time in a long time it's an amazing thing to watch a group of people come to a consensus and you know participate um so i do can i say one other thing too congress's job is to deliberate and they're so bogged down with 30 to 70 percent of their time trying to raise funds from you know the corrupting influences that have destroyed our government that there's no deliberation And that's what's happening in Occupy Wall Street. Citizens are deliberating. Right. And across the country. Uh, And and that's part of what I'm concerned with, or, you know, that's part of what our group is trying to think of, is how to start to connect these other groups to these issues of national concern. Because so many of the issues are systemic. They're not local. Um, Right? I mean, we've got fundamental systemic problems that require solutions maybe on the level of constitutional conventions or, you know, something, some kind of fundamental change. Um, And so we're trying to, you know, and, and obviously the social media networks that exist, the technology that exists, we're just not, you know, we're able to have a conversation, you know, Missoula is able to participate in the national conversation, um, which is just amazing. It really is amazing what's happened in the last, I guess it's only been six weeks now and things are moving so incredibly quickly. Um, You know, our small occupation just uh, drafted uh, a declaration of occupation that was at once you know, connected, I think, to the national concerns and then also our own local concerns. The Carlisle Group had, has purchased our water supply. Ah. Yeah. So, very They concerned. own Dunkin' Donuts, too. Yeah. So, pretty yeah. soon, Dunkin' Donuts is going to be coming through your faucet. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, there's still, you know, it's not too late. We still have the ability to, to purchase it back, um, but without some kind of intervention. Um, it's going to be gone, and we're very concerned about that. And so there, so the local issues were also, it's just, it's been an incredible process um, to watch. And so are you involved also then with working groups and with the General Assembly in New York as well? Yeah, I mean, I'm mainly with the political and electoral reform working group, which is awesome. Um, they're such a great group of people. There's, uh-huh. a, you know, a broad spectrum from left to right. And one of the things I love about the group is that they really guard their independence. You know, we've, we've established a process, you know, that's sort of been, you know, what we've focused on. And, and uh, there are, there's a subgroup that's trying to create a viral campaign, um, you know, for an Article 5. The main group is dealing with more, like, electoral reform uh, around, like, you know, um, the Electoral College at the state level, uh, you know, tightly drawn districts, things like that. Um, I wanted to say something, though, that what's interesting about what you just said is uh, there was this anthropologist named Beads. Um, what's his last name? It's going to kill me. Anyway, he hated U.S. Day of Rage's, like, corruption kind of thing. Um, and, you know, he's, he's a computer scientist. He's like, listen, the way you change institutional reform is creating really hyper-local. So what oh. you're doing is fantastic. You know, um, it's uh, – I think it's wonderful. I mean – uh, it, that 
we can, that, even the idea around tightly drawn districts is kind of an important thing because, you know, right now we have one represented to, I think it's to 400,000 constituents. That's like not what our founders really intended. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, it, you know, watching how all, you know, I didn't have, I'm not, I don't have an activist background at all. Um, this is my first time being politically involved in any way. And so I didn't have any experience with kind of the direct democracy stuff that I think a lot of people who are involved with activism did. And what I love about it is that, you know, you just, you can create your own ideas and your own projects. Anybody can just say, I'm going to do this and you do it. And as long as it's not affecting, you know, as long as the group doesn't stop you from doing it, it's really maximizes creativity in a way that I've been amazed by, really. Um, so I, so as somebody who was a little bit, and I, and there still are issues, I think. One of the issues you're hearing, like I interviewed Doug Henwood, and he's talked about this issue quite a bit, is how does a horizontal movement, and the word he used is scale, right? Like how do you take it, how does it not fizzle out? How do you, you know, create organizational structures um, without that are sustainable, that are durable without doing damage to the horizontal structure. Um, and I, and I kind of, when I first came into this, what I can say is that I did not understand. And I think a lot of people don't understand or appreciate the strengths of horizontalism, which you know, like we said earlier, in terms of making everybody involved and then also in allowing people to come forward without having to get permission, without having to do anything. You can just say, I'm creating this and go do it. And in general, everybody's really encouraging about it. Um, so I've been, and then also watching how leaderless horizontal uh, groups group interacts with horizontal groups like they're or I mean with vertical groups they're very baffled by it I mean um, uh, Nathan Schneider who has waging nonviolence recently wrote an article that saying that that's kind of what's going on with the clashes with the police is they're vertical and they're very organized and they don't deal very well with kind of spontaneous things that happen. Like most of the, um, in New York, most of the times where you've had arrests or where you have pepper spraying or violence, it's been a spontaneous thing that happened that wasn't part of the planned March. Um, and, and the same thing. And then somebody else too, I think it was, um, and I hope I pronounce her name right. Delia Lithwick of Slate, wrote an article about the fact that the, the traditional media, you know, you know, they're kind of demands that we have demands that a big part of that is that they just really wanted to be able to report on it by showing up and saying, okay, where's your press packet and your glossy thing that says who the leader is and who the demands are and all of these types of things. And so, you know, watching traditional vertical organizations interact, they're very baffled by a horizontal <clears throat> organization, but uh, I've just been stunned by the advantages that it has. So I think also that other organizations like unions, you know, and also other political associations like parties will find a similarly baffledness when they start to approach it. I mean, like, listen, you know, I'm not going to try to say that there aren't, uh, it isn't the possibility that people who are, you know, brainwashed into just simply looking at things from the partisan, you know, uh, perspectives aren't, couldn't help to co-opt as they, as the term is, you know, any, any occupation. Um, but for the most part, um, I think that I see two sort of fundamental First of all, I think it's fantastic. I mean, look at you. You're a perfect example, too. Here you are. I don't know how long you've been in it, um, but, you know, it doesn't really matter because somebody else, two days, three weeks, and here you are, you're, you're interviewing everybody, and you're becoming a thought leader of sorts. And right. you're, doing a func you're doing a function that, you know, whether it's for history or for people just kind of getting up to speed, you're, you're providing a service. Um, right. 
Yeah, I mean, it was partially just I was inspired by our group was in our communications working group is the name of our group was really inspired by the idea of a direct action idea that we were not finding what we wanted in the media. And the idea of direct action is, well, you don't complain about that. You just create what you want, (laughs) right? It's very empowering. It's incredibly empowering. And we didn't have to ask anybody if we could do it. We just started doing it, you know? So yeah, thank you. I think there's two main issues that I see like for myself. It's like, I, I really try to keep things really granular. It's like, what can I do as a citizen today to affect the kind of, um, you know, follow my instinct, my own intuition, my own creativity, just like you just talked about. Yeah. Um, the second thing is um, a lot of times people are, you know, it's like they get, they're shocked. Like, oh my God, Obama didn't change Washington. And it's like, like- there's so much energy expended by shock. It's, it's like shock and awe, actually. Right. And when you, when you just stop, I'm talking about me when I say you. When I just let go of being shocked and just looked at the landscape. um, And, you know, I don't really care. It's like, I don't, you know, I don't care about the credit. It's not that I don't, you know, as a human being, don't want a pat on the back. But if people that I respect know the hard work I've done and they give me a pat on the back, that that's enough for me. Right. Right. Um, You know, instead of like lobbying the press, like, "Do, do you know what you stay, you know what I mean? Like, I will say this, when I've had people, I've kept my mouth shut, but when I've had people come out and say negative things, then I'm going to like basically mow them down because (laughs) there are tons of people who worked on their hours off organizing in Austin and Seattle. You know, our Seattle organizer was in the hospital the day before the 17th and somebody else came in and and swooped in and, and all that hard work, you know, I just feel like that this is not the time to be you know, telling, because there's so many, there's so many unknown stories, right. you know, <clears throat> and also you were talking about your, the idea of horizontal versus vertical, I'm sorry, um, their the meeting of the two, right. you know, yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to say that, um, well, what was I going to say, uh, it, it doesn't matter, we just focus on what it is that we have to do. Um, there is a multiplier effect. And that's not to say that our other main issue isn't specifically that, for me, I already know that these interests, historically, they are, they, they're, they're not friendly. You know, this is, when we're talking about power and the application of power, and if we're talking about a government that's controlled by powerful factions, they don't just hand their power over because people on social media like started crying. Like that doesn't, that's not the way it works. You know, these are very dangerous forces. So, you know, part of it is also creating a scenario that makes it impossible for them in a particular way. And I'm in a, and for me, I'm completely nonviolent. You know, I'm talking about just using our brains, our creativity and our brightness to get this government back. <clears throat> in the hands of the people. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us. We appreciate it so much. And we appreciate everything that you've done that you jumped into the void with, you know, really took some leaps of faith and, and, you know, we are really grateful. How lucky am I? So thank you for all the work that you're doing.